God. We're going to jump in this morning with what I believe uh, is, is something that we all really can feel. That, that we absolutely can, can go, oh yeah, I get that one. Sometimes you, you talk about something and, you know, you the 20% rule, 80% get it, 20% just don't. I think this is like a 99.9% rule today. The topic we're going to cover is something I think is relevant and real for all of us. Because if we're going to be honest, most every single person in this room is, feels pretty independent, don't we? I, I know I do. I mean, we like having people around. It is nice for people to pat us on the back and go, good job. We like that. Hey, do you see what I, yeah, good stuff? We like having people around us to celebrate us. But at the end of the day, we're very independent people, aren't we? we we're kind of do it on our own. We can make this thing happen, depend on ourselves. It's part of our an American DNA. And you, you live in America, and you're just kind of born with this DNA that you can do it yourselves. You may knock me down, but I'm going to get back up and I'm going to do this thing on my own. Well, the truth of that is, is, is kind of interesting. It's, it's, it's not actually possible. I mean, we have that DNA in us, and we feel it. We can be independent. We can do this thing on our own, and we might could track with that for a little bit, but ultimately, life is bigger than us bigger than anything we can handle on our own, bigger than, than just picking ourselves up by our bootstraps and kind of doing our own thing. And so, so we get challenged and we get knocked down. Even God himself saw this, saw this kind of DNA that's probably not just American, but in, in all people, this desire to be so independent. And God said this in, in the scriptures, don't forsake assembling together. Now, some of you have read that and maybe even heard a message that that was church attendance. Hey, God's standing at the door and he marked you off when you came in. Good, good good. Oh, it's been a long time since I've seen you, you know, and so that's kind of the impression we have of that scripture, isn't it? You know, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but God's heart behind that verse is so much deeper and so much more about you and I, where he simply says this, listen, it is impossible to do this thing on your own, so don't give up the one thing in the one place in the one spot where you can have people that come in behind you. You can have people who, honestly, at the end of the day, have got your back. You ever just really wanted that? Someone who absolutely had your back, someone that would, that would fight for you, you know, when the chips were down and you're, you're flat on your face, that, that, that they had your back and they're right there for us. So we all actually love that truth, by the way. I mean, even just saying that some of you are thinking about your favorite movie already, you know, and, oh, I love that, and that movie win, you know, he went down, and, and the, you know, the people stepped up, and, and they did this thing, whether it's the Lion King, or whether it's the Terminator, or whether it's the Notebook, whatever that thing is you're thinking about, that moment when someone stepped in and just, and just had someone else's back, it's in our movies, it's in our stories, and, and, and we love that truth. And so that's where we're going to go today. That's, that's what we're going to be talking about fighting for each other. Not, not fighting against each other, that's a different message. Fighting for each other. What that looks like, what it can mean for us as people. And so if you are new to us this morning, know this, that we're a church that wants to fight for you. We're, we're a church that wants to have your back. If, if you've been here for a long time and just been kind of settling in, know this, that we're a church that wants to have your back that wants to fight for you. That's the kind of people that we want to be, that we know we're called to be. Sometimes the challenge is just knowing how to do it. That's this morning. So that's where we're going to go, and we actually find that message in the book of Colossians. So uh, if you've got your scriptures or your Bible apps, go to Colossians. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, find that, and we'll dive in. And as you're doing it, let me give you my uh, favorite parenting fight for moment, just as you're finding your scriptures to set us up. So uh, we have three kids, uh, Audrey, Eli, and, uh, and Benji. Well, before the third came along and we realized we were absolutely done, uh, we just had two and we thought, oh, we can have a lot more, but we're not. So anyway, so we had these two. We had Audrey and we had Eli, and Audrey is about six and Eli is, I think, three or four, and, uh, and they were, they're my kids. That's all I'm really supposed to know. So, so anyway, Eli's in the basket, and Audrey's kind of walking beside us. So we're in the grocery store, and I'm pushing the basket. Don't know where Jen is, and so we're just kind of walking around. Um, and we're walking down this aisle, and this group of teenagers came walking by, and they were fussing with each other. They were saying things to each other, you know. Rah, 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 rah. Well, when we walked by them, for some reason or another, Eli thought that they said something to, her sis to his sister thought that they were fussing with, with her. 
And if you know anything about our middle child, I love him. He's he's my dude. He's my he's my son. I have a great time with him. He's mild mannered. He's pretty laid back. I mean, he's just he's just as easy going as it comes. Well, the dude got lit up. I mean, he he thought they were saying something for him, and all of a sudden, I'm just pushing the buggy, being a parent, and he's like, "That's my sister!" So screaming this, "That's my sister! That's my sister!" And the teenagers have no clue what's going on. Just, just keep walking. Just keep. Walking. <laughs> And I literally have to hold him from coming out of the buggy, I assume in just full-on attack mode. I have no clue what he was going to do, what was going to happen, his little sippy on their head. You just don't ever say anything to my sister. And so two, two things, I felt two things. Honestly, the very first, not the very first thing, but the second thing I felt was this. As a parent, hey, that's not the appropriate way to handle conflict. Don't scream and holler at people at the store. The very first thing I felt was as a dad, I was like, yeah, yeah, boy, you get him. Don't make me turn him loose. Don't, I'll do it. Um, and so, so as I was thinking about this message, that, that is my classic, thank you for letting me share that. That was my classic number one fight for you moment, because we just love that. We love those moments when we know someone has our back. That if someone does something, if something happens, that someone is standing behind us shouting, don't do that to my brother, don't say that, that they're there with us and for us. And what is interesting and what I love about God's word is so real and so applicable, that literally happens in the book of Colossians. Actually, Colossians chapter 2. So let's see what Paul does, screaming from his little buggy cart in the grocery store, uh, and see what happens. So here it is, Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to read you about five verses. It says this, Now, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you. That's the NIV how it says it, but I think the King James says contending for you, but the actual idea there is fighting for you. I want you to know how much I am fighting for you and those in Laodicea and for all those who I have not even met personally. My purpose is that those people may be encouraged in heart and be united in love so that they may have all the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, which we're going to talk about next week, namely Christ, and whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I tell you this so that no one will deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For I am absent from you from the body, but I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. And so we're just going to focus on that first part because I think that is so amazing. I want you to know, Paul says to us, how much I am fighting for you. For those folks that that know me and and know who I am, I am contending for you. I am fighting for you on your behalf. And for those that I haven't even met yet, i.e. you and me, Paul contends and fights for us. You'll you'll see a little bit later on in, in the scriptures how Paul actually prays for future believers and engages and fights and contends for future believers, you and I. So here is Paul fighting for us. And I love this picture of, of, of him doing that. Now, when I, when I think about fighting for people, in, in my understanding and how I, how I experience it, and I'm, this is not the actual right way, we're going to talk about a different way to do it, most of the time we fight for people as a reaction, don't we? You know, someone shows up and they're, and they're beaten or they're wounded emotionally, spiritually, and they're hurt, and we go, oh, oh, let me step up, and we dive into that and we fight for them. What's, what's the problem there? They're beat up, broken, and, and hurt, and we're just kind of there cleaning up the mess, helping them. When I was in high school, uh, I think I was a senior in high school, I had a, had a really good friend, and we, uh, that Friday nights you go to football games, and after football games you did one thing, all the cool kids did one thing, um, and so you went to Burger King, so we got in the car after the football game, we drove to Burger King, OBK, and we were hanging out there, having a good time, and so I'd, I had parked the car because I was driving, and I went in to get a shake. So when I came out, my friend, his face is all swollen, and, and he's got a black eye, and I was like, dude, what happened to you, man? What happened? And he's like, well, I said something to somebody in the car beside me, and two guys got out, and they jumped on me, and they just, they just, they just smashed me, and they took off. And I was like, what? And, you know, I was like, well, let's go find them. Let's, you know. Now, I'm not a football player. I was in the band. And so I don't know what... <laughs> 
I don't know what I was going to do. When I got, you know, we found a plot the trumpet and go, oh, I'm going to play I, the tiger. And you went, dun, 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 dun. Just, I don't know what would have happened. But it was my fight for you moment where Scott, his name's Scott, where Scott and I were driving around looking. Now, toward the end of that night, we drove around for 20 minutes and then we went back to Burger King. And that was it. So I, I remember asking him, dude, so, so how was it? You know, I was, I was ready to fight for you as a friend. He's like, honestly, Jim, I really wish you'd have been there before. I got my face kind of all smashed in, and I've thought about that quite often, that, that a lot of times how we fight for others is very reactionary. You're, you're already beat, you're already bloody, you're already, you're already messed up emotionally or spiritually, and then people rally around you, oh man, yeah, and, and that is a good thing. I think if anyone crosses your path, and you know, a, you know, a spouse or a friend or, or someone in, in, your, in your community that's, that's been roughed up spiritually, emotionally, that you step in and fight for them, but honestly... How much better would it be if we had each other's back fighting and contending for each other before the fight broke out, before we were wounded, before we were hurt, before we were spiritually taken out, that we had each other's back fighting and contending for each other in a very proactive, before it all happened kind of way. Now, this is why I love Paul here in the book of Colossians chapter 2 is because that's what he does. And he shows us in his own life and actions how to fight for people in a proactive way, not, not after they've been beaten and bloodied and messed up, but he fights for people before all of that happens. So this morning, that's what we're going to take a look at. How does Paul do this? How does Paul fight for us in, in such a proactive way, uh, fight for us before we absolutely need the medic? And so when you read uh, the first chapter of Colossians, you kind of you see it. Colossians chapter 2 is starting, hey, listen, I'm fighting for you and I'm doing this whole thing, but it's in Colossians chapter 1 that you catch the two things that he does, how he proactively fights for each other. So if you've got a pen or paper, write this down because we're going to be challenged to do this in the coming weeks. The first thing that you'll discover that Paul does fighting proactively for those he loves, cares about, knows, doesn't know Christ followers is simply this. Three times in the first 10 verses of Colossians chapter 1, Paul says something. Got your Bibles, just kind of look. Quick read. He says this, I'm praying for you. Three different times in the first 10 verses of Colossians, Paul simply says this, I am praying for you. And, and as I read that and understand that, I, I love this image that the way Paul starts the fight for us, the, the way he dives in, the best way that we can proactively be fighting for each other is by praying for each other. Now, you may wonder, why, Jim? I, I, prayer? What? Huh? What, you know, why, why is prayer so effective? Let me give you what someone said about prayer, and I, and I like this. I'll show it up here for you, too. It simply says this, prayer is more powerful than habits. It's more powerful than your heredity, more powerful than your natural tendencies. It can overcome all of these things. It is more powerful than the forces that hold the planets in place. Prayer, though it comes from the heart of an unlearned child of God, you and I can suspend the very laws of the universe. If such be God's will, just as the sun stood still when Joshua prayed, there is no other power on earth that the enemy of soul hates more and fears more than prayer itself. Now, that may be a different idea of prayer than you had. You might have come in here and said, you know, I, I get prayer, Jim. It's, wh it's what I do when the dinner table is set. God is good. God is great. Thank you for the food we ate because somebody's already started. That's kind of, that's kind of our general idea and understanding of prayer. Yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, no, no. Do you realize that prayer is this incredible weapon that we wield to keep each other safe? Have you ever thought about prayer that way? That, that prayer is a sword that you use to stand in front of your friends and your family, that you, that you take out the enemy with that are trying to attack them and then trying to take them down, that, that you're standing there with that sword of prayer offensively. But prayer is also a shield that you use to protect them. You're praying for them in protection. That, that prayer is, is both your sword and your shield. It is this, this weapon that we have to protect those we love and care about. And when you start seeing prayer that way, honestly, you kind of start praying differently. 
and you start getting hold of a truth, that that is how we begin to truly fight for each other. Now, James 5.16, I think, nails it. If there's a great verse on prayer, it's James 5.16. Anybody know what it says? Well, there it is. All right. Uh, uh, you guys totally could have cheated. It says this. Uh, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, all right, don't raise your hands on this one. How many of you read that verse and go, yeah, that's a good one. doesn't really apply to me because I don't feel very righteous. I'd say that's probably 85% of us. That, that you read that verse and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, good one, Jim. I like that one on prayer. But that's like for pastors or, you know, I even read that and I think, yeah, that's a good Billy Graham prayer. You know, that's, 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 you know, because when I see that, the prayer of a righteous person, I automatically feel disqualified as if my prayers are less and my prayers don't, don't matter. I, I feel that, that, that press of I'm just not righteous enough for my prayers to matter to God. Am I the only one? I think we all can feel that, and we lose one of the, the best verses in the Bible on prayer. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Let me tell you something this morning about righteousness. You've got to understand this, that righteousness does not come from you. You are not in charge of manufacturing your own righteousness. In fact, if you try to do it, you're probably going to utterly fail. Most folks try it and they get into legalism and all those kind of things. Righteousness does not come from you. Where does righteousness come from? That's right. It comes from God himself. Let me flip you over to Romans, Romans chapter 4, and give you just a great picture of where our righteousness comes from. This is Romans chapter 4, verse 21. This is Abraham. They're talking about Abraham here. And so let me dive in. Abraham, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. Abraham just believed God. God, you said it, you're going to do it. Remember we talked about faith as, as knowing, believing, and then acting. That's, that's faith here for Abraham. He, he believed it and he acted on that promise. He wasn't perfect with it, but he did it. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Catch that. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone. This wasn't just an Abraham thing but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness to us, for us who believe in Him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. What is, what is God saying right here? He's simply saying this. Hey, listen, if you believe in me, if you're willing to act on that, if you're, if you're willing to step into a relationship with me and say, God, you're real, you're alive, your son Jesus Christ matters, matters in my life in this world, and, and I'm willing to surrender to that and just follow after you. If, if you're willing to do that, what God does is simply go, oh, yeah, I got you. Here you go. I'm making a swap. Your filthy rags, Scripture calls our attempts at righteousness. Let me just take those. And I'm not even going to try to wash them. We're just going to dump those out. And I'm going to give you my righteousness. The righteousness of God can be had by every man, woman, child in this room that chooses to follow Christ. And it is a beautiful and powerful thing. A righteousness is not dependent on you getting it all right. Righteousness is not perfection. Righteousness is pursuit. Pursuit of God. What happens for me, and, and probably for you too, is, is when we falter or fail or stumble, what do we do? We tend, God's here. We tend to run in the other direction. I, as far away from God as I can get. He doesn't want to see me. I just, I'm over here. What the Scripture calls us to is something the complete opposite, is when we falter and fail, not running from God because we don't have righteousness, but running to Him because we need it. And the thing that we say to our Savior when we stand in front of Him, broken and bruised and battered and faltered and failed, is simply this, God, I need Your righteousness. And what does Scripture say? He absolutely wants to give it to us. It's not, hey, oh, you've got to explain yourself. Saturday night, I saw it. saw what you did. Some of you guys are a little nervous now. Uh, he doesn't hold it from us like that. He simply says this, if you're willing to do business with me, then I'm willing to do business with you and give you righteousness. And so that, James 5.16 applies. The prayer 
of a righteous person, which is each and every man and woman in this room. You can have that if you want it. Your prayers are powerful and effective. And I hope you grab that. I hope as a man that when you think about praying for your family, I know sometimes we can struggle doing that, that the very first thing that you feel is God's voice speaking to you saying, you're righteous, your prayers make a difference. That as, as a woman, as you're, as you're doing life in this world and, and everything is going around and, and you, you've had the kids and craziness and, and you don't feel very righteousness, that you hear God's voice saying, your prayers matter because I have given you righteousness. And we step into prayer not as something hoping it makes a difference, but we contend and fight for each other in a very proactive, very real way because we're righteous people whose prayers matter. We don't catch anything this morning. Catch that. Be filled up with the truth that Jesus Christ can and does and will make every single one of you righteous people. It's a beautiful truth. Uh, one other thought on prayer as, as we're kind of cranking through this. I'll give you this one. This is something that someone else said about prayer. When our prayers mean something to us, that's when they really mean something to God. Is that in the Bible? Nope, but I believe it. Think about it. When our prayers mean something to us, that's when they really mean something to God. What do I mean by that? Simply this. Uh, a lot of times I fall in the trap of praying generic prayers. You ever done that? Uh, especially, especially with my kids sometimes. We, we're praying. What do you want to pray for? I'm tired. I'm ready for them to go to bed. I'm ready to watch a movie. I'm like, just pray. Just, let's get this done. And so they're praying, and Jesus, bless the world. I'm like, yeah, that's a good one. You know, can I have world peace? Great. You're sounding like Miss America. This is good. You know, just praying for big, generic things. Here's the thing that I've discovered about big, generic prayers. They don't really matter to me. You know when a prayer matters to me? You know when I'm in that moment when, when something it really is meaningful? I'm praying in detail. You know, Jen and I have a, a squabble or a fight, and, and I'm going to Jesus with detail. God, can you fix her? I think she doesn't. <laughs> she, she needs wisdom to know that I'm right, and just all this other kind of, I know she's praying a different way. Um, <laughs> But when I'm, I'm in a situation at work or uh, in life, what am I doing? When something is personal to me, I am praying specifically. I've got details. I've got left and right, ups and downs. I've got, God, this, this is exactly how I want you to take a look at this. Can you do these things? And, and as I think about that, I think that's when prayer matters to me. When, when I am in the details of something, boy, boy, it matters to my heart because it's become real to me. And I believe that when something really matters to us, God pays attention. It's kind of like your kids. They come in, hey, mom, I want a, I want a, you know, I, I want a $6,000 car for, you know, Christmas. And we're like, yeah, you know you're not getting it. You're just asking just to see. Your kids do that every once in a while. No, no, no. But, but they come in and they're like, you know what? I, I, I really need to share this thing on my heart. What do you do? Whoa. Whoa. You kind of perk up because you know this thing matters to them. God is just like a parent to us. He has heard us say a thousand different things. He knows our hearts. He knows when we're just filling up the space with words and trying to get our kids just to hush up so we can go have mommy, daddy time. He, he knows when that's happening. So when we stop and we get real and we get specific, God, this is really what I'm dealing with here. I believe he goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, now, now it's getting real. This is good stuff. I want to hear what you have to say, my son, my daughter. Let, let, let's work with this. And so I believe the more specific you are with your prayers, the more they matter to you. And the more they matter to you, the more they matter to God. And, and I think it, it absolutely makes a, a difference, getting specific in your prayer. So, so here's the deal. If you're going to fight for someone in prayer, which you should be doing, if you're going to fight for someone in prayer, don't be generic. God help them today. Get specific. As you contend for those people in your life in prayer, be specific. Now, this is going to require some of us to get out of our box. Uh, introverts in the house, put your heads down. Because I didn't know what else to ask you to do because you're introverted. Um, so, for those of us that maybe struggle relationally, that, that may, I don't know. Here's, here's the out of the box thing. You might have to wait in and ask someone, how can I pray for you? Have you ever done that? Have you ever just done that? Ask someone, how can I be praying for you? Some of you have, and it's a really cool moment, isn't it? Maybe it's just you asking your spouse, how, 
No, seriously, how can I be praying for you? Asking your kids, you ever ask your kids, how, how can I be praying for you, those around you, those in your family? And that is a big jump. That can be really scary. That, that can make all of us, I tell you what, I get a little nervous, especially with someone I don't really know, but I feel like God wants, to me, wants me to be praying for them, for me to step up and go, hey, you've been on my heart. How, how can I be praying for you? How can I contend for you? How can I fight for you? But, but that is such a powerful thing. Having been on the recipient end of that question. I'll tell you what, that is a game changer for me. Knowing people have stepped up and simply said this, Jim, I care enough. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to contend for you as my pastor. How can I pray for you? I'm just like, whoa, seriously, that's awesome. And I, I can tick off six or seven. Hey, these are the things. And I know they've got things specific, so they're not just praying generically. God, help our pastors not to screw up that they're praying specifically. God, help Jim in his marriage to love his kids, to love his wife. Help Jim as, he, as he's doing these things in life that he shepherds as well, that, that you are contending on my behalf. And so I would say this, if you choose to fight for those in your life in a very proactive way, do it specifically. Be willing to step in and simply say, "Hun, how can I pray for you? As challenging as that may be for you, it is life-giving to those around you. You, you might have never even done that before. If you have it, this is your message for you to be able to wade in and to contend for each other in, in prayer. And, and I would add this. Not everybody is comfortable praying with people, and I totally get that. That's, I've kind of learned to be comfortable praying with people. If you're not comfortable praying with them, it is okay. You don't, I'm not telling you you have to stop them and go, okay, for the next six hours we're going to stand here in the lobby while I pray Jesus over you. Just, just ask them write it down, put it in your pocket, and when you get to your prayer place, your prayer spot, your prayer drive, wherever it is, you pray for them. You contend for them with God. The prayer of a righteous person, which is every single one of you, is powerful and effective and makes a difference. I hope you get that contend for people, fight for people in that kind of way. Now, now when Paul fought for folks, and this will be the last one I do when we wrap up here, when Paul fought for people, he prayed for them, and that was the one thing he did. There's a second thing that he did that I think is just as important. You ready for number two? Here it is. Paul prayed for them, but when you read the first chapter of Colossians, you're going to discover something else that's actually pretty cool. Now, Paul showed them Jesus. Now, Paul's in prison. He's doing, he's, he's doing prison time right now, and so it wasn't like he could just be there and go, this is Jesus in my life as I'm living it, as I'm doing it, and you can see Jesus in me. So what Paul had to do is he had to write Jesus to them. Hey, hey here's who Christ is, and, and here's how he matters, and here's how, how he's changed my life. And so he, he writes to them about who Jesus is, but for us, I don't think most of you are just here on furlough and you're heading back somewhere else. You're here in life with those people around you. And so our call is to show them Jesus through how we live. This is who Jesus is in my life. This is, this is who he is. And, and we show them by, by living him, by living his truth. Paul says this in Galatians 2.20, For I am crucified with Christ, but it's no longer me who does this thing. You know who it is? It's Christ who lives in me. And you may wonder, how in the world does living Jesus in front of folks fight for them? Simply this, and this is a beautiful thing. When, when you live Jesus in front of people, you are encouraging their hearts. You are giving them hope. You're giving them strength that something is greater in this world than their circumstances. I don't know how many times I've been just doing life and I get overwhelmed with the two or three little things that I might have to deal with and someone comes along and has got this thing and they're walking through it and they tell me, no, but here's how Jesus has just grabbed me in this and how he's carrying me. And I step back and go, whoa, whoa, that's, that's good stuff. And, and all of a sudden, the things that are tearing me down don't seem to hit near as hard anymore. What, what was that? It was the Jesus they were living. Let me give you a great verse. Uh, Romans, or Revelation 12, 11 simply says this, they overcame him, the enemy, the great enemy. They overcame him by the power of his blood, which is, you know, the, the Christ and crucifixion and surrender and the gospel. And... By what else? The word of their testimony. 
Now, some of you guys know testimony because you're old schoolers, and you hear it. Let me hear testimony, and we got a little testimonyers out there. Yeah, and so what is a testimony? Testimony is your story. A testimony is your story of how you walk with God. Do you know your story is so powerful that when you live it and when you share it, this is me and Jesus and doing life, that the enemy himself, the great enemy who broke all of this to begin with, can't even stand against that? They overcame him by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the word of their story. Your story is powerful. Your journey of how you walk with Jesus changes things. And that's what the scripture tells us. But you may be thinking, Jim, but my story's not perfect. It's got ups and downs. It's got sins. It's got, it's got failures. It's got all those things. Your story isn't about perfection. It never has been. If your story is not perfect, then you are in the right place because this is the not perfect club. I'm president. Good to have you here today. <laughs> This is not about a story of perfection that we have. This is just about our story, and I'm going to use the word again, a pursuit of God, of how we take truth and we hear truth, and we wrestle with truth. I expect you to wrestle with the things that I say because they're hard and they're not easy to do, but to wrestle with it and get to the point where God takes that truth and says, oh, it's time, and he just mashes it in, and we start to live it. That's the journey, and there are going to be ups and downs in that, but those ups and downs are your story, and at the end of the day, your story is one of the most powerful things that you have, and as you share your story, as you invite people into your story, into your heart and your life, you know what you're doing? You're fighting for them. You're contending for them. You are encouraging them, giving them hope and strength, and and, and you are offering that. So every single one of us in this room, have this powerful thing that we can offer those around us if we're willing. Because I'll tell you, it's risky offering your story. I guarantee you, I don't I talked about Jen and I. Some of you have judged me, and I'm all right with that. Um, it is risky offering your story. It is risky being real and vulnerable. Let me go back to a scripture at the very beginning. What did I say God said about us? Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Confess your faults one to another. God brings us together so that we can be real, so that we can do life, because He knows we need each other. We need, we need your successes. And guess what? We need your failures. And we need to know how Jesus is walking in you, not so that we can go, oh, good for you, so we can go, that encourages me. Here's the challenge. And the challenge that we can pick up here in Colossians chapter uh, 2, and it is very practical. The challenge for us is simply this, is to fight for those God has called us to fight for. For you and I not to be reactive and wait till somebody's kind of all beat up and bloody, our spouse is about to leave us, our kids are angry and upset, the people around us are, are in utter turmoil, but to fight proactively for those that God has brought in our life. And, and so the first thing you're going to have to do, honestly, is the same thing I'm going to have to do, is choose. Who am I going to fight for? And that was the church thing to say, I'm fighting for everybody. I'm fighting for all you guys. You can't. You ain't got enough time in the day to do it right. You look around and find the people that God is asking you to fight for. Look in your family first. Is it your spouse? Is it your kids? Is it your neighbors? Is it, who is it in your circle? That's your responsibility those people that God has put in your circle. Fight for those people because that is your responsibility. But you want to do ministry? Then you look outside that circle. You look around here on Sunday morning and go, I don't know you, but you look like someone that needs to be fought for. And you step in and you take them as someone you're going to contend for, for a season, for life, and you engage. So what does that require? requires us to get specific. How can I pray for you? That's your question to ask somebody this week, where you step in and go, how can I pray for you? Blow their brains. Just, say, whoa, what? You're, what? you're kidding me. What? You're asking me that? Yes. I want to know how I can pray for you. And, and write down what they say and then contend. And then live Jesus in front of them. Not perfectly. Just live Jesus in front of them and see how much that makes a difference in their life. We want to be a church that fights for each other each and every day. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm going to pray that God seals this message to our hearts, and then we'll have a time of worship.
Father, you were the original Rocky. You fought for us before we ever even had a clue of how to fight for each other. And so, God, this morning, I want you to contend for us. Some of us are wrestling. We're wrestling with righteousness. We're wrestling with prayer. We're wrestling with, with you know, feeling like this is something we can even do. We're wrestling with apathy. We're wrestling with indifference. We're wrestling with so many different things. So, Father, we need you, first and foremost, to fight for us in this moment. Rescue us and redeem us and pour your righteousness out on us. Don't let the enemy lie to us. Let us feel your presence in a very real way. And then right now, bring to mind the people we need to be fighting for. Make it easy, Father. Make it simple. Bring to mind the people that you want us to be fighting for. Let those names be real and fresh. And then give us the courage to wait in, to be contenders, to be warriors for each other so that we can be the kind of people that grow in your faith and your love, that the enemy doesn't pick off one by one, but that we stand as a group. We stand as your church. People know us because of we're united in love and how we fight and love and care for the ones that we know that are around us, Father. Give us that in a very powerful and very real way this morning. We depend on it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.